Steve will tell us in our, the first talk about uh, how uh, P4 is like JavaScript. So JavaScript is really an event-driven language. Computations only happen when the user does something, like clicks a mouse. And you know, P4, only programs, the programs run in P4 only when a package shows up. But it doesn't have to be this way. So what other events could be interesting for P4 programs? OK, great. Thanks, Mihai. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Steven Abanez. I'm a PhD student here at Stanford University. Uh, I work with Professor Nick McEwen, as well as Gordon Brebner at Xilinx Labs. And I'll be presenting some joint work today with Nick and Gordon, as well as uh, Johnny and Tichi. Um, this work was really inspired by some initial discussions within the traffic management sub-working group within p4.org. Uh, so a number of other people have contributed thoughts and idea to this along the way as well. So just to give you a bit of context, a bit of background, the traffic management sub-working group is a small working group that's in, within p4.org, uh, and it's focusing on way, discussing ways to uh, enable programmability of traffic management functions in our data planes. And the first topic we attempted to tackle was enabling programmability of active queue management. It turns out to be a pretty challenging a task to try to, to try to implement active queue management policies in P4. And the reason for this is because active queue management policies often need to shuffle data around in a way that doesn't quite fit in with the, the packet-driven processing model that's provided by P4. So we developed a new programming model for the data plane, which we're calling event-driven packet processing. And uh, yeah, so let, let's go ahead and, 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 oh, and it turns out that this programming model is, uh, it reaches beyond just active queue management and is useful for a number of other applications as well, such as uh, load balancing and congestion control and network telemetry. So the P4 programming model was really uh, motivated by the need to express packet processing programmatically at the highest possible line rates. And how do we implement line rate packet processing? Well, we use this PISA architecture, which is this feed-forward pipeline of stages where each stage contains some, some memory and some compute. Uh, it's local to each stage, so each stage can operate independently. And this allows us to proc process packets at line rate and uh, provides nice deterministic throughput and latency guarantees. Um, and this is really the architecture that P4 programs are meant to be compiled onto, this feed-forward pipeline. So the programming model that's exposed by P4 is this synchronous packet-by-packet processing-based programming model. However, if you look at an actual deployment of a PISA architecture, you'll see that this simple diagram doesn't quite capture the full picture. There's also real deployments also have this recirculation path. So right off the bat, we can see that this isn't actually a, a feed-forward architecture exactly. Why does, this, why does this recirculation path exist? Well, oftentimes we want to use it to update some state at a previous pipeline stage. However, the P4 programming model just treats this recirculated data in the same way as all the other packets that are coming in, and this often doesn't quite capture what the programmer wants to express. A real arch piece of architecture will often have this uh, packet generator module, and this is the only element in the architecture that's not driven by packets arriving and departing from the switch. So it can be used to trigger the P4 program to, to perform some operations independently of packets arriving and departing from the, from the switch, but the packet generator itself is not really exposed to the P4 programmer in a nice, convenient way, and has to be configured via this separate channel. Additionally, uh, a real piece of architecture will be uh, the pipeline will be running at faster than line rate just for the purposes of being able to process some of this recirculated data and the generated packets. So, yeah, so uh, what we'd really like to be able to do, are, so, so let me make this a little bit more clear. Um, there's a number of data plane applications that don't quite fit in into the P4 programming model. One of those sorts of applications is the types that perform periodic tasks. For instance, Hula is a load balancing application that needs to periodically generate some probe packets to measure link utilization along various paths. Um, and this 
can be accomplished by generating packets from the control plane or from the end host, um, or it can be accomplished by manually configuring packets, uh, or manually configuring that packet generator module that I showed on the previous slide. Um, but the actual periodic sort of behavior doesn't quite fit into the P4 programming uh, model that's exposed. Additionally, Count and Sketch is a very popular programming model or uh, app, app, data plane application that's used today. And uh, it requires a, some periodic task. In particular, the data structure needs to be periodically reset. So in order to avoid unnecessary control plane overhead and have the control plane reset uh, manually, again, that packet generator can be configured to assist in this operation. Another interesting class of data plane applic applications is the sorts of applications that need to update state multiple times, uh, and the, also the sorts of applications that need to update or use some state that's sitting in a different pipeline stage to make a different decision. For instance, consider uh, applications that want to use congestion signals in the ingress pipeline. Uh, for instance, active queue management policies that want to implement tail drop policies or uh, congestion control algorithms like NDP. Now, con common congestion signals like the queue size, the queue service rate, uh, the queuing delay, these are uh, commonly available in today's P4 switches. They're exposed in metadata fields and uh, exposed to the egress pipeline. Uh, however, in order to make them accessible in the ingress pipeline, they need to be recirculated and then dropped off in a register. Other sorts of congestion signals, like the packet loss volume, the rate of change of the queue size, the timestamp of buffer overflow or underflow events, uh, or per active flow buffer occupancy, are all other sorts of congestion signals that we'd like to be able to use, but there's not really a good way of kind of uh, exposing them or using them in modern P4 switches. So we believe that our data planes should enable us to derive all of these sorts of congestion signals. So our approach to overcoming these limitations is to generalize the, the packet-driven uh, programming model that's provided by P4. So generalize the concept of packet arrival and departure events into the more general class of data plane events. In particular, here's a non-comprehensive list of uh, data plane events that we'd like to be able to support in our data planes. Uh, when an event fires, it provides some data to the programmatic logic that it's triggering. That data might be both packets and metadata, or it might be just metadata, um, hence the distinction between these two, classes of, uh, these two classes of events. The packet and metadata events, these are the typical sorts of events that are supported today. Ingress packet, egress packet, recirculated packet. Uh, and then the metadata-only events, these are the sorts of additional events that we've identified as being useful for implementing lots of uh, other sorts of uh, a wide range of data plane applications. Uh, so this includes thing, events like whenever a buffer gets in queued or dequeued, or whenever a packet gets in queued or dequeued from the buffer, whenever the buffer overflows or underflows, whenever a timer expires, whenever uh, link status changes or the control plane triggers some processing logic to occur in the data plane, whenever a packet finishes its transmission, or whenever a user-defined state condition becomes true. So. Let's see how we can, derive, how we can uh, build an event-driven programming model that exposes all these sorts of events. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's just build a, a, a logical model that supports ingress packet events, in queue events, and dequeue events. The other sorts of events can be supported in a similar sort of way. So whenever a packet, uh, uh, so, so we'll start with something that looks very familiar, just an ingress pipeline followed by uh, the traffic manager. And then to add support for in-queue events, we'll add a separate logical pipeline, this in-queue pipeline. And then whenever a packet gets in-queued into the uh, traffic manager's buffer, that traffic manager will, gen will extract some metadata about that packet and fire uh, an in-queue event, which then triggers processing in this in-queue pipeline. And similarly for dequeue events, uh, whenever a packet gets dequeued from the buffer in the traffic manager, it fires the dequeue event, which then triggers the processing in the dequeue pipeline. Each of these pipelines has some notion of local state, as well as some notion of global shared state. So at this point, you're probably all wondering, is this actually feasible to implement? Did he just say shared state and P4 in the same sentence? Uh, so uh, I'd like to stress that we believe this sort of programming model is indeed supportable. Uh, to be, it can still support pack processing packets at line rate. It doesn't have to sacrifice that. Um, so let's take a look at how we can implement a, uh, uh, 
how we can allow P4 programmers to write uh, event-driven programs. For the sake of a, an example, we will try to compute the total buffer occupancy of the, of the, in the traffic manager. So recall that uh, when we write a P4 program, we write it for a specific architecture. That architecture would need to define all the sorts of events that it currently supports or that it supports, as well as this additional type of extern that we're calling a shared register. So this register is essentially, or this uh, extern is what allows these separate event processing threads to share state amongst one another. The P4 programmer then instantiates an instance of that extern at the top of their P4 program. They implement the ingress pipeline uh, logic. This is the, the, the logic that handles uh, whenever an in, that handles the ingress packet event. The, this, it simply just reads the buffer size register and then uses that information to make forwarding decisions. The P4 programmer also implements uh, a separate control block. So this is uh, the, the logic to handle the in queue events. And this will increment the size of the buffer size register. And they implement a separate control block to handle DQ events. And this, is the, uh, this will decrement the, the size of the buffer size register. So essentially, we'd like to allow the programmer to express uh, event processing logic as separate threads with some notion of shared state. So you're probably all wondering, is this actually practical to implement? Um, let me, to address this concern, let me divide the discussion into two parts. So one about lower line rate, lower line rate devices and higher line rate devices. On lower line rate devices where multi-ported memory is in fact uh, practical, this uh, logical approach, each of these logical pipelines might actually be implemented as separate physical pipelines and each of them might have some uh, read and write port to this global shared state. This might be the right way to do it if our, if our target supports multi-port memory and we're, uh, if, if that's a practical thing to do. However, on higher line rate devices where multi-ported memory is impractical, we have to take a different approach. So in, in this case, these separate logical pipelines would actually be mapped onto the same physical pipeline. So that state is always local to the same uh, physical pipeline stage as it is in the normal piece of architecture. Uh, so here's a little animation that uh, demonstrates the flow of a packet through this pipeline. So an ingress packet event occurs, the parser extracts the headers in the normal way, which then propagate through the match action pipeline stages. In the normal way, the uh, deparser reassembles the final packet, which is then inserted into the buffer in the traffic manager. And now once the packet is inserted into the buffer in the traffic manager, it will extract some metadata about that packet that was just in queued and fire this in queue event and recirculate it back around. And now this metadata for, for uh, this, this metadata that's propagated by events can propagate through the pipeline in uh, either by itself or it can be merged along with the headers and metadata of incoming packets. For instance, consider the case where an ingress packet event fires at the same time as a DQ event. In this case, the DQ event metadata can be merged with the uh, headers and metadata of the ingress packet and they can propagate through the pipeline together so that it's not consuming an extra slot in the, pi uh, in the pipeline and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't reduce the bandwidth of the actual packets that are going through. So let's say we wanted to compute the queue size. We wanted to maintain a register in our pipeline that maintains the queue size of all the egress queues. Uh, on this particular clock cycle, maybe the packet wants to read the size of Q1 and then use that to make forwarding decisions. And then the DQ event that fired wants to subtract the 100 bytes from Q0. So how do we handle both of these read, modify, write operations, both of these memory operations, without result resorting to multi-ported memory? So I won't dive into the details of our approach to do this right now. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk more about it at the demo. We have a demo set up. Um, but just to give you a very brief high-level overview, uh, instead of using multiple, uh, in, in, instead of using multi-ported memory, we can instead use multiple single-ported uh, register arrays, where the packet events always perform the read modify write operations on the main register array that stores the algorithmic state that is our queue size in this example, and the metadata read modify write operations are aggregated in separate read, uh, separate register arrays, uh, and are then applied to the main register uh, whenever there's idle clock cycles, whenever there's extra memory bandwidth available. And these idle clock cycles will occur whenever larger than minimum size packets are in the workload, uh, or also uh, 
because the, the pipeline, remember that the pipeline is running faster than is required to process packets at line rate, and so there will be idle clock cycles. And because of this fact that the pipeline is running faster than is required to process packets at line rate, this allows us to bound the staleness of the state of the, bound the staleness of our algorithmic state. So, uh, so we think this approach is is. Uh, is is completely feasible. We've prototyped it. So come and see our demo, and I'm happy to chat some more with you about it. So our demo is uh, we implemented this event-driven architecture on the NetFPGA SUMI board. Uh, our, the topology looks like this one on the right. We have two flows, a TCP flow and a UDP flow, sharing a congested 10 gig link. Um, and we implemented a P4 program that uses in queue and DQ events to compute per active flow queue occupancy. Uh, and then we use, it uses that information to make tail drop decisions. So we implemented a simple version of the uh, fair red active queue management policy. Uh, it also uses uh, timer events to periodically query the size of the algorithmic state of the uh, queue occupancy, and then if the current sample is different than the previous sample, it'll generate a log packet and send that to the monitor so that the monitor can precisely trace the queue occupancy uh, without receiving a whole bunch of redundant information. So to conclude, uh, let me just say that, or let me conclude with just a well-known observation, and it's that all network algorithms are essentially event-driven. All the sorts of algorithms that we can express in P4 today are a strict subset of what we can express using this more general event-driven approach. Um, these events give our programmers more flexibility. We can allow them to compute pure, uh, we can allow them to derive and use congestion signals and uh, compute or update state multiple times. And also, since we have timer events, it provides a way to compute, perf, uh, compute functions over windows of time much more naturally. So we're hopeful that this approach will lead the uh, programming model or f guide future design decisions for the P4 programming model. I'm happy to take questions. There are two microphones in the back and some in the room, if you want to ask your questions. Is this something that's being considered as part of the new language constructs that are underway for the next two years? So I have been discussing this with a few people. I expect the way that this would impact the P4 language the most is in how the architectures are described. Um, and so we, the, if you look at how architectures are described today in P4, it's, it's not a very precise description of how, these, uh, how packets flow through the actual architecture. And so defining the architecture in terms of the sorts of events that they, that they support is um, probably the way that it's going to impact the language the most. So it seems that there's sort of a trade-off between staleness of information and kind of pipeline bubbles. Um, how do you, what do you think is the right approach to managing that trade-off? Yeah, so, so there's, there's no, uh, I'd like to point out that supporting, we believe that supporting these events doesn't affect the processing of packets at line rate. Pack, packets, packets will always be processed at line rate. It's just a matter of how stale the algorithmic state is that's used to process the packets. And you're right, there is definitely a trade-off. Um, here, and I believe the trade-off can be exposed to the network operator. So the network operator might decide to disable some switch ports in order to use that bandwidth to reduce the staleness of their algorithmic state. So that could be an additional trade-off that isn't currently available, but um, could definitely be uh, exposed to network operators. Any more questions? Thank you.